Kanaritpit, and welcome to Swangan. I'm your host, Dennis Allen. Welcome to a new season of Swangan. Here at the Inuvialuit Communication Society, we are pleased to present the life and times of our people here in Canada's Western Arctic. This season, Swangan has taken a fresh approach at portraying what it's like to be an Inuvialuit in the 21st century. Join us as we meet some interesting people with some very fascinating stories. This week on Swangan, we visit Taktiaktak, where James and Marine Pokiak make their home. Have you ever wondered what it's like to live in the unforgiving north? Well, we've got a story for you. Welcome to the season opener of Swangan, Our Strength. My name is James Pokiak, I live in Kutkuyakku. I was born in Sac Harbor on Banks Island, but my parents moved to the mainland and settled here in Tuktoyak back in 55. I come from a family of 16, 11 girls and 5 boys. When we were growing up, of course, we come from a large family, like a lot of families in the community here, and uh, basically it was the older children's responsibility to care for us when we were younger. But when we were growing up, we were always told by our parents that you have to respect the environment, you respect other people, um, and um, work hard, and, 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 and try and do things in a, in a way where, you know, you learn from what you're, what you're, you're taught. We do local town tours, two-hour van tours, and we also have another tour which we call a cultural day tour. Our population up here in Tuck is 900, stays pretty steady year-round. How Tuck got its name, it was named after the caribou. In 1953, Tuck was finally established a hamlet. Was it named it Tuck Toyak Tuck, after the caribou? How you pronounce caribou in the Inuvaluit language, Duktu. Maureen Pokiak. I came up here in 1974 to teach school. I'm from Saskatchewan. I grew up on a farm there. But um, I came up here to teach school and uh, lived here a couple of years and then I got married. James and Maureen run Ukbik Tours. Tour company in Inuvik books the tours. They send them up here and usually Ricky meets them at the airport. The largest pingo is in Alaska. This one out here to the left of us is the second largest in the world, 50 meters high. We give them sort of an overview of, of things in the community, of the Inuvialuit people. Um, then they have a, uh, we talk about our fishnet and fishing and the preparation of the dry fish. Up here in Tuck, we're only 5 meters, 15 feet above sea level up here, not very high. If you want, I can take photos of you people standing against the board if you want. Oh, you say, welcome to Tuck the Ektuk on the board of Kana Duktuyak Tumakapsi. Welcome to Tuck the Ektuk. Many of us in the Beaufort Delta take our home for granted. But others travel from around the world just to say they've been here and have actually dipped their toe in the Arctic Ocean. Not many people can say that. A visit to Tuck would not be completed without a visit to the Tuck Fur Shop. Marine truly enjoys the serenity of the northern life. Things are a little bit more relaxed here than they, than they are down south. Quite a bit more relaxed. I don't care to leave Tuck too often. I, this is home and I, if I'm in a new week a day, that's long enough for me. <laughs> There's lots of good things about living here. Like where else in the world can you just walk out your doorstep and see whales? I mean, uh, whales or swans right below the house and where you jump on your skidoo and you can go all over, you know. Um, there's some really neat things about living here. 
you look out and it's pretty flat and there's no trees. Um, the weather's cold here and it was cold in Saskatchewan when I grew up and it gets hot in the summertime so there's quite a few similarities. My family's here and uh, I really like uh, going out on the land with, with James and the kids so this is home. Traditional food is really important to a lot of people. It's a lot of hard work. In the end of the day, it's good. It's always good to sit down at a table and have a roasted fish or, or do a caribou soup and, or cook maktak, raw maktak, tibakta, uh, like the sting maktak. These are foods that uh, my generation was brought up with and, and it's really, really, it's going to be really hard to, to not be able to have access to that stuff. James and Marine made certain their children retained the value of traditional food. We still enjoy turkey and chicken and stuff like that, but it's, it's always good to have that traditional food handy. They all know how to prepare and harvest the, you know, the, the foods that we, that we use. We'll be right back with more of Swangan, our strength. And now for more of Swangan, our strength. We have three children. My son Jacob is 20, 26 now. He's assisted me a lot in my big game hunts. He's always been my, my assistant guide. And this year was the first time that he had an opportunity to, to uh, start, start it on his own. He purchased uh, some dogs from a fellow in here in Tuck here, and, and, and I, I helped him in the initial startup of, of outfitting to do a hunt and and that's one thing that he's, he's really interested in and he's good at it. I mean he, he, he knows how to go out there and live off the land and, and myself with him, well with all my children I have no problem in them going out on the land and, and not having to worry about them. I mean this is one thing that he wants to do and, and in order for him to do it and be successful he's got to do a good job. And there's, there's no room for error when, you, when you're in, involved in big game guiding. I mean, it, there's so much that is involved. Safety, um, the way you do it, uh, your equipment is a big factor. I mean, the way you train your dogs and to, to do a polar bear hunt. Um, the other hunts are not as bad because you can use snowmobiles, but the dog team takes up a lot of work and, and it's a 100% commitment. Myrna is uh, the oldest girl and she is working at the Prince of Wales Museum in Yellowknife. She um, graduated with a BA in um, Native Studies and uh, so now she's working there. Myrna is the one who, who is really outgoing and she's out there, she's looking at different opportunities. Rebecca is the youngest and she's 20 and uh, she's working in Inuvik. She's working at the research center this summer and over the winter she's taking uh, some college courses. They're doing very well. They're responsible. They, they're able to go out and, and, and live away from, from home if they need to, which is a big part up here is just too many young people um, um, always tend to end up back in their home community. I mean, regardless where you live, the home is home. Uh, but if you don't have the, the incentive to go out there and, and pursue something and, and, and continue to do it, I mean, it's really, really hard. He did his first polar bear guiding trip with me this year. He had his first hunter. He got a nice bear. And with the funds that uh, he got from from the hunt, he went and he bought himself a a, um, a house, a grads package, which we're in the process of building right now. It's 26 by 30, and and that's what he put his 
earnings into, so you know, it's a really good move on his part. I know it's going to be a long, long haul for him once he realizes that, you know, these monthly payments have to be made, but one good thing is when you own your own home, you know, you're actually putting your money into something that's useful and going to benefit you. They're open to understanding others' uh, point of view a little bit. I hope they have more tolerance. I don't know if they do or not. Maybe we'll just have to wait and see. We spent quite a few years out at Anderson River when the kids were smaller. Um, uh, it was really good. And so then we hunt caribou and then we fished and we went berry picking and then uh, James would set his trap lines and go on the trap line. And when Jacob got old enough, he went with him. All those skills that you learn out on the land that are so important and all of them, uh, now that they're adults, um, they really want to come back to the land. It's just like anybody else, you know, they want to spend time out on the land. Jacob can do that, he lives here. But for Myrna and Rebecca, it's a little bit harder. They can't just pick up and leave their job whenever they want to. And for the two girls, they want to do things that their dad has done. And um, this year, our oldest daughter went on a polar bear hunt with Jacob and her dad, and she really enjoyed that and she hopes to do it again, and the same thing with Rebecca. She went on one last year, so, yeah. Good way to have, to raise children, to ha have or develop family bonds. It's really, really a positive experience. We book polar bear, grizzly, caribou, and musk ox hunts. Clients come from all over the world, mostly the states, but we've had clients from Germany and Brazil, um, Argentina, uh, Canada, all over. Oh, we had a really um, uh, a doctor from Argentina that was really a neat fellow. Uh, he, he was really pressed for time, and so he he wanted his hunt to go quickly, and he he wanted his bear within five days while he got it within five days, so he was pretty happy about that, yeah. The polar bear, it has to be done by a dog team, and I have my own dog team here, which I've had for about 20 years now. To get out to the polar bear hunting area, we're allowed to use snowmobiles to transport all the equipment and the dogs and and uh, once we get to the hunting area, then the skidoos are parked and the dogs are used. Myself and my brothers, we, we, um, my father had a dog team and we did a lot of wood hauling, ice hauling um, in the winter time with the dogs and we fished all summer for them for the winter's feed and I, I grew up with a dog team. I, I think we were one of the last ones to use dog teams to go to Husky Lake and um, when skidoos first came up out, we, we used to always wish to have one, and, and um, but dogs are a good mode of transportation, you know, they're, they're trustable and reliable. I got back into dogs about the late 70s, early 80s. Um, my family and I spent a lot of time out in the bush. We did, I did a lot of trapping out there, bush trapping, and um, that's where we raised our children until our two older ones were in high school. Um, the last two years of high school, uh, of course, they stayed in the uh, residence of uh, Crowley Hall in Inuvik before it shut down. And um, up until then, we spent anywhere from four to five, six months out in the bush. It's a lot of work, but when you're running a dog team, it, it gives you a lot of time to do your own personal thinking and thoughts. You know, there's a lot goes through your mind, and it's quiet. You don't hear the hum of the motor, or just the, the patter of the dog's feet while they're when they're working, and it's just the quietness and and the ability to make the dogs go where you want them to go. And the training is it takes a lot, a lot of training. Um, um, 
it's just like anything else. If you if you if you work hard enough at it, you know, you, uh, you know, it works the same thing with the animals. When you train them to do a certain job, and they're they're able to to perform and do it for you. We feed them a lot of fish in the summertime and water them. We water them a lot. Um, and, um, it's hard to leave them tied up in the summertime but because it's so the, the terrain and that it's really hard to do anything with them around here. So we feed them a lot of fish in the summer and, and water them a lot. When the dogs are not working for you, well then you've got to work for them. Fish that right now I've got a three and a half mesh net uh, and I catch coney, whitefish. Later on it's going to be herring. Um, I've caught some uh, an odd loss, um, but it's mainly the whitefish and, and, and coney right now. In the fall time later on it's just herring. We keep all the live whitefish and um, we make dry fish out of them. I had a uh, in the water creek last summer and I caught a beaver. Some of it will just freeze like that and we'll have it for quack in the winter. Um, all the dead ones of course go uh, for the dogs and smaller ones. That's, that's what we set aside for my dog team. And the bigger ones is what we usually work with, the big live ones. Yeah. We'll be right back with more of Swangan, our strength. And now for more of Swangan, our strength. Even when you're just traveling out on the land or skidooing or ice fishing or going with the dogs or like you say, working with a dry fish, um, yeah, you just do a lot of thinking and, and um, it's good for you. It's always good to have that traditional food handy, like a lot of visitors come and go. Um, we have friends, I mean, friends visit and we, we pull out a dish of maktak and, and it's just enjoyed by everyone. Um, you know, there's a lot of preparation that goes into it, there's a lot of hard work, but it's, you know, when you're basically sitting down at the table eating it, that makes it even more rewarding. You know, it, it's a lot rewarding too when you're able to, to help people who are not able to harvest these animals and, and have it available for them, you know. Not lots of, lots of it, but you know, enough to get by. I mean, the food up here is so important. The Inuvialuit of Tuck have a unique way of storing food. We have a community freezer here where um, it was built in, uh, I think, the early 60s, and, and there's about 30, 30 rooms down there. And I make a lot of use out of that community freezer because of my dog team. So we do a lot of fishing in the summer, and we store a lot of the food down there for the winter's dog feed. I make a lot of use out of it. 
uh, the rooms are there. All you got to do is to get a little padlock and keep the door locked. And, um, but normally, you don't even need a padlock on your door down there. I mean, it, it's a lot of work putting the stuff in and then taking it back out again. But it's a, it's a good way of storing foods, whether it, it be for your dog team or for your own personal use. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's of course free. It doesn't cost any power to, to operate it. I mean, it's there and it's available for the community members to use. And a lot of us make use of that. Okay. How big, how big are your shoes, Brianna? Pretty big today? Mm -hmm. We'll tie them up and make them tighter quick so they don't fall off because you have to have them really tight to go down, okay? There's no way to it. Oh, there you go. You want me down there, James? Sure. Well, you have to tie up her shoes. Stand back. Yeah, I am. I am. Might collect on your insurance. <laughs> James credits his success to the values his parents instilled in him. Long ago, when when you did something, you, you know, you basically went and talked with your neighbor, and the handshake was good enough in in, in, in what you were planning to do. But nowadays, you. It's gotten so bad where you have to keep really close track of, of, of who you're dealing with. And it goes down to your upbringing. I mean, if, you're, if your parents instill in you that you have to have respect for your fellow neighbor or whatever, I mean, you're just going to be brought up learning to, to, to respect. But if you're if you don't listen to what your elders or your parents are telling you, um, that, that's going to happen. I mean, it, it's happening now and it's going to continue to happen. I mean, um, respect is a real big issue up here. I mean, if you don't respect someone, then you shouldn't expect to be respected either by that same party. I mean, it works both ways. I mean. But when you're growing up, and, and, and you talk to your children, you know, about daily things that happen, and um, you just try and work things out with them to make sure it benefits them in the end. Thank you for watching Swangan. Here at ICS, we enjoy what we do and hope it shows in our programming. We invite you back for more. Queen Aini.